And speaking of men of the church, we will hear now from our Chia Pet pastor. Hello! How you doing? Well, I, I, I did not, I mean, I am not wearing a chia pet, a plant on my, my head. No, that didn't happen. I didn't my, stick my finger in his light socket. Uh, this is not a perm. It's not a wig, nor is it a helmet. Uh, I, I told you, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm a homeless guy in this movie coming up, and, and we're supposed to shoot it two weeks ago, but it didn't snow, so we're going to have it another two weeks. So you got to put up with it another two weeks. And what's happened is I was for a while, like, putting a lot of hair product on it and scrunching it really tight to make it look short. But that just got too expensive and too hard, so I'm letting it go. This is it. I'm letting it go. So, so I feel like I'm back in the, the you know, like 60s, you know, peace, man. <laughs> peace. <laughs> Make love, not war. All right. All right. So try, try to get beyond this and, and uh, you know, I don't know. We'll see what happens. It's kind of fun, though. It, it really is kind of fun. You can do a lot more things with longer hair. When you have short hair, you can't do anything with it. It's boring. I can, I, you should see the shapes I can put this thing in. <laughs> all this side, all that side, all up. It's just, it's just a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Hey, uh, thanks to Steve Weens for an excellent message last week. Wasn't that fantastic? <laughs> Love that guy. Yes, that's fantastic. Uh, he, he's from Church of the Open Door, and, and we've always had kind of a good relationship with them. I, David Johnson and I go way back. And um, uh, we're looking at, at doing more of that. Uh, I, I just think it's so healthy. So I hear the message from different perspectives, with different voices, and people with different hairstyles, you know, and different genders and different ethnicities. And uh, you can hear the same thing from two different people, but it lands uh, because one person says a little bit different. And I just think, so we'll be doing more of that uh, here in the future. Okay, we are going back to the book of Colossians. Yes, the book of Colossians. And we're, uh, uh, we were studying that uh, back in November. Then we took a break for a series, and then we had Christmas happened, and all that stuff. And now we're going back to the book of Colossians. And now we're going to take another look at this magnificent hymn that is in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, this this uh, hymn of, of Christ the Creator and, and having supremacy in all things. And then we'll add a few verses as well. So we're actually going to make some progress here. We've, we've already looked at this uh, passage, I think, three or four times. But we're never going to rush around here, so we're going to look at it again. I'm going to entitle this, this message, The Bridezilla of Christ. Yes, isn't that, Trevor's so clever with this very expensive art he puts up here. I actually uh, wanted to entitle this, the, uh, the uh, well, I, I, my, my choice was to say that it should be uh, the, the, the uh, ink-stained, foghorn, uh, in, in, internal explosion, horse manure, obscenity church. You get all that? I want to entitle it, the ink-stained, the ink-stained, uh, foghorn, internal explosion, uh, horse manure, obscenity church. You'll see why. Uh, but they thought that was a little too long, so we're going to go with the bridezilla of Christ uh, for reasons that will hopefully become uh, clear here in a second. Colossians chapter 1. Just capture how completely magnificent this hymn is. It's just so exalting. The sun is the image of the invisible God. The sun is the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. All things have been created for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All, 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 all. He's just straining language to just put Christ in the most exalted position possible. And he is the head of the body, the church. Christ is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything, in everything, he might have supremacy. Supremacy, sorry. For God is, was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This magnificent hymn is so triumphant. It's just incredible. Now he's going to apply this to the church. He says, once you were alienated from God, and we're enemies in your minds because of your evil, I mean, because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you, praise God, holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Hallelujah. If you continue in your faith, 
established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Where's our hope to be? It's in the gospel. Don't move from that. This is the gospel that you heard and that was, has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Mm. It's a good passage. It's a, uh, that's good scripture. Pray with me here for a moment. Abba, Father, thank you, uh, God, just for your presence here this morning uh, and uh, your presence in the worship service, the sweetness as we sing about your grace and the power of your name, the shelter that is your name, and, and the fresh Holy Spirit falling on us. Uh, Father, will you take that, that spirit now and infuse that with all the freedom and power and fun and electricity that was present before, Lord, infuse this message with that power and authority uh, to write it into our hearts and minds and, and to build your kingdom, bring your kingdom and for everyone who's listening through podcasts, television, any other way, Lord, I, we pray for them, Lord, that whatever they're doing, that, God, you'd capture their attention and, and melt their hearts to receive this word. And, God, for those who need encouragement, let it be a word of encouragement. For those who need hope, let it be a word of hope. For those who need conviction, let it be a word of conviction. But we surrender to you. For in all things, you are supreme. Have your way. Have your way right here, right now, in Jesus' name. And the bridezilla of Christ said... Amen. Amen. This uh, hymn is just so fantastic. It's, it, it's, as I said, Paul straining language to try to, in some way, express this, the magnificence of Christ. He's a, the, the image of the invisible God. He's before all things, the creator of all things, whether in heaven or on earth, visible or invisible, thrones, powers, dominions, authorities. He's, all things are created by him. All things are created for him. All things are created through him. He holds together all things. He's the firstborn from among the, the dead that he could have supremacy in all things. And God was pleased to have the fullness dwell in him. Everything that makes God, God dwelt in him. And, and through him, he's reconciling all things to himself. And he's bringing peace to all things. It's just fantastic. This is magnificent. It's God-glorifying. It's awe-inspiring. Awe but there's one, one part of this hymn uh, that we read that doesn't seem to quite fit. And you may have noticed I just left that part out. Uh, right in the middle of this cosmic, it's been called the hymn of the cosmic Christ. Right in the middle of it, Paul says, and he's the firstborn, or he, he's the head of the church. Then says he's the firstborn from among the, the dead, that he might have supremacy in all things. Firstborn, or the, the, the head of the church. What is that doing there? You have this cosmic, cosmic Christ, and this exalting stuff, and then there's the church. There's a sense in which it fits and a sense in which it doesn't fit. It fits in this sense. Uh, it fits Paul's theology of the church because Paul's got an incredible theology of the church, this grand, magnificent, beautiful church. Uh, the church is called the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. Uh, it, it, the church is construed in, in Paul and in other authors as being the, the central purpose for which God created the world, at least so far as God's uh, revealed it. Uh, this, at the center of creation is, is this bride. Uh, we're, we're to be an expression. This people who say yes to God are an expression of the Father's love for the Son. We've talked about that before. And, and, uh, and so we're, we're, uh, the, the mirror is a reflection of God's glory, and we're invited in to the fellowship, the magnificent, ecstatic fellowship of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. And we're made participants of the divine nature, it says in 1 Peter. We partake in the perfect love that God eternally is throughout all eternity. And we'll be dancing with the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit throughout all eternity as the bride of Christ, made a dance partner of God. And it's this beautiful, fantastic, grand vision of, of, of church that Paul has. And, and then we're called the body of Christ. He calls us that in this hymn that we read. Uh, the body of Christ, which means we're called to do what Christ did in his first body, but we do it in a corporate way. Uh, we're, we're to be the hands and feet of Jesus, as we sang about a little bit ago. Uh, you know, we're, we're to look like Jesus and love like Jesus and serve like Jesus and spread the word like Jesus and love our enemies like Jesus. We're, we're, we're called to be the means by which God brings the gospel into the world and his will is carried out on earth as it is in heaven. We're called to be the means by which he brings reconciliation to all things and by which he brings peace to all things. We're called to be peacemakers. Uh, it's a beautiful, magnificent vision of the church. And it even has a cosmic dimension to it. Paul says in, in Romans 8 that the entire creation groans like a woman going through labor uh, because we're, this whole creation now is alienated from God and oppressed but it's groaning for the manifestation of the children of God. 
As, as, as the children of God go, so the whole creation goes. There's a cosmic dimension uh, to the vision of the church in the New Testament. And we even get that in this hymn here. Uh, Paul first talks about the reconciliation of all creation, and then he says, and you also, God is reconciled. He, 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 he portrays the church as sort of a microcosm of what God's doing throughout the cosmos. The whole cosmos was alienated and now is being reconciled, but now we've been, we were alienated, but we've been reconciled. And so the church is called to be the first fruits. We've talked about that a lot around here, where we put on display the coming kingdom. We're to manifest what it looks like when uh, uh, creation is, is redeemed. We're supposed to be a sneak preview of, of the coming kingdom. And so there's this grand, magnificent, beautiful, Jesus-looking portrait of the church that we're given in the New Testament. And that fits this hymn. That, that fits. Uh, it can make sense out of why the church is in this beautiful cosmic Christ hymn when you understand Paul's theology of the church. But there's another sense in which the church doesn't seem to fit this hymn. And I think there is an incredible, profound truth in thinking about this. When you think of the cosmos, when you think of Christ filling the universe, what comes to your mind? When you think of the galaxies, the billions and billions and billions of stars and quasars and black holes and, 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 and just the expanse of, of the universe, and, and you realize that Christ creates all of that and holds all that in place. And when you think about the cosmos, there's this grandness, this magnificence, there's this awesomeness that, that we associate that with. But now, think about the church. What comes to your mind when you think about the church? But maybe some people think of a little church in the Dale, a little rural church. It's kind of quaint and cute. Um, others might think of sort of a mega church, something that's really slick, a good Jesus marketing program. Uh, not necessarily a positive connotation there, maybe. Others might have an even more negative connotation of the church. You think about the church, you think about Christians. And when you think about Christians, you think about maybe judgmental people or intolerant people or people who are trying to you know, control the culture and impose their will on others and maybe unloving uh, people. I don't know. But none of it really seems to fit this cosmic dimension of this hymn. At best, it seems the church seems too small. At worst, the church seems petty and foolish and, and maybe even evil. And it doesn't fit the grandness of this hymn. I'm going to be real, real here, okay? Uh, I'm going to be very honest. I've had a covenant with the church that I will speak from my gut and be honest. I'm going to be raw here. I'm going to be real here, okay? Um, and uh, for the next 10 minutes, some of you may think that I, am going to, I, I sound like an atheist. You'll think, is that, is that a Christian up there on stage talking? Uh, others may feel a little uncomfortable with what I'm going to say, maybe even a little offended by what I'm going to say. I encourage you to hang in there because I promise you that there'll be an edifying word at the end of this whole thing. And I assure you that I'm not an atheist, uh, but, but it, it may not sound like it for about 10 minutes, all right? So you kept me slack for 10 minutes. Um, there's a rule that some people have that they bring into church, and the rule is that the job of preachers is to always make Christians look good or to put a positive spin on things, and we're sort of selling the Christianity product or the Jesus product, and, 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 and that's the job of preachers. And I just got to tell you that I think that is a real dumb rule, <laughs> and I'm going to break it. Uh, so if, if that rule is important to you, well, then uh, prepare. Get ready. Uh, but from the gut, here, the thing is this, in all honesty. I, I love you guys. I, I, I love you guys. I, and I love Woodland Hills Church. And I love some of the stuff we're doing. I love what we just did in this Making Space campaign. And uh, people, when we pull our, our sacrifice, our resources, pull it together uh, to see the kingdom go. I love that. I love that. I love you. I love this church. I, I, I love what we stand for. I love some of this, the, the, the distinctives of this church. I love some of the ways that we're not typical. Um, these are the ways that tend to aggravate other people. Uh, but I love that. I, I love that. It costs us a little bit, but I, I'm okay with I, I love that we stand for, for, for some of this stuff. And I love Jesus. Believe me, I love Jesus. And I love the gospel. And I love the Bible. And I love the kingdom. I wouldn't be standing up here talking to you if I didn't love with all my heart that. Having said that, <laughs> uh, I have never really been a, a fan of quote unquote, the church, the church at large. I, I, it's never really grabbed me. I, I, I never can get excited about that, just being honest here. Um, about 30 years ago, I was in seminary at Yale and uh, attending this church, and the pastor asked me to be uh, an associate pastor. 
And I said, yes. So I, I was the associate pastor of this church, and everything was going well for about a year. Then he left. He left me with this church. And as soon as he left me with this church, and I'm just doing this part-time. I'm a seminary student. You know, this is a side job for me. But now this church is, is, is in my charge. As soon as he leaves, I find out that there's been a war going on in this church for the last 50 years, between, mainly between two powerful families, but they all had their little alliances built. And they have, over the last 50 years, taken turns fighting one another and getting in charge. Everyone wants to be on the board so they can run the church. And there's this power struggle. And it was the ugliest thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was, it was grotesque. The, I'd never seen such hatred. I'd never seen such venom, such unforgiveness. People just holding on to things that were said 35 years ago. And the anger, it was just grotesque, putrid. Yeah. Never seen anything like it. It was, yeah. And now I, I got to deal with this. There was one service where it kind of all came to a head. When, 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 the, when the, the pastor left, okay, there's, now there's this leadership vacuum. And uh, so everyone's vying for power. So the power struggle begins. Ugly. And there's one service. I was actually the song leader of this church. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> by and by when the morning comes. So I'm leading the, the song uh, uh, thing. And... Um, in between hymns, we finish one hymn, and I'm looking for the next hymn. A lady stands up. Now, this was a Pentecostal church, and therefore it was permissible to do this. Um, she stood up and gave this quote-unquote prophecy. She was on the side of the board, the, the, on the side of the, the group that was not in power. So her prophecy, quote-unquote, was that the board should resign. <laughs> <Ooh -wee! laughs> yeah, see, this is why. I think the gifts of the Spirit, I believe the gifts of the Spirit, I work in the gifts of the Spirit, but I think they work best in small contexts, like the New Testament church was. You get a group like this, and no one knows who the person is, and anything can happen, and that's why we, think, we, we say if anyone's got a word that they think is for the whole church, uh, you submit it to leadership, because it's got to be censored before it goes to press. <laughs> that's our policy here. So this lady stands up, thus says the Lord, the board should resign. Immediately somebody on the other side of the auditorium stands up and says, thus says the Lord, you're a false prophet, the board's not supposed to resign. Then somebody else over here says, thus says the Lord, no, that was a true prophet, you're a false prophet, the board should resign. Then another person stands up and says, no, you're a false prophet, you're a false prophet, but you're a true prophet and the board should stay. And boom, like dropping a, a, a match into a, 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 a tank of gasoline, this church explodes into counter prophecies. And I'm still looking for the next hymn that we're supposed to sing. Where's that stupid hymn? Hymn number 666. That's what we're in. It's like, it was nuts. It was crazy. <laughs> All over, people screaming counter prophecies. Pointing their fingers, that's says the Lord. And then we had just converted. This tribe of gypsies, God bless them, they're just the most wonderful people, but very demonstrative, very emotional. And, and, and uh, they all of a sudden stood up. There's about 30 of them. They stood up, and I, I, I'm, it's like it happened yesterday. They're right over there. I'm still looking for the next uh, hymn to sing. They stand up, and they start marching around the church. It was so screaming and hollering and wailing, and I don't know whose side they were on, if they're on anyone's side. I don't know what they're doing, but... One lady was saying, they're squelching the spirit, they're squelching the spirit. And I'm going, yeah, you got that right. Something's going on here. But uh, so they're, 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 people are screaming at one another. They're marching around. I look up and I see in the foyer of the church, out in the vestibule they called it, a fight breaking out. I, people hitting one another. It's like, what is going on here? I'm just a seminary student looking for a stupid hymn to sing. And there's this craziness. Now we were looking for a senior pastor and we had a guy candidating that day. This is wonderful. <laughs> It gets better. So he, to show his authority as, senior, as, as a possible senior pastor, comes up and he grabs the microphone from me, tells the organist to crank it up, and he starts trying to lead us in a hymn. Because I'm like frozen up there. I'm like, you know, what, what's, what's going on? I don't know what to do. So he starts singing, peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. It's like <laughs> the song doesn't quite fit the circumstances here. But about 10 people are singing it while the others are quite giving counter prophecies or fighting out in the foyer or marching around the church. And at this point, I start laughing. I just start laughing. I don't know. I, start, I, I just back up and I, I just start laughing. I, after that, I did not want to go to church again ever. I, I was done. I, I, I was done. This is this carnival. Uh, it, it was. 
I, I, was, my job was to, after the song service, to welcome all the newcomers. That was awkward. That was, it was, although I, I told him, I said, you know, uh, I doubt you'll want to come back. But then again, I bet you've never been to a church that's this, this interesting. <laughs> what a show. But I, I didn't want anything to do with church. I, I was done. And God had to really deal with me uh, for a period of time after that. Um, and really showed me that opting out was not an option. I uh, had to just deal with my heart on this whole thing. I came to the conclusion that, you know, I've got a lot of good reasons for believing in Jesus. I reviewed all those reasons, why I believe in Jesus. I know why I believe in Jesus. But see, Jesus is the one who uh, died for the church, his body. And, and uh, so if I'm going to follow him, I have to be part of the body. And so I made the commitment that, Lord, I'll continue to serve you in whatever capacity you put me in, and that's going to be, in, I'll stay involved in the church, but I want you to know that I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it at all. I'll do it in spite of the church, but, but I, I don't like it, and I, and I stuck with that commitment. Um, and and, and I, things have gotten better since then, for sure, but I still find that I just don't, it, when it comes to the church at large, I just don't, I, I don't groove with it. I don't fit with it. I, it's something, oh, I, to this day, when I hear Christians on, on uh, evangelical Christians on television or on radio, often I, I, what they say just makes me cringe. Not all, but, but some of it like, ah, ah. Or I, when I see debates between Christians and non-Christians on, on television, especially during election seasons, I, I, I got to just turn that off. It's not good for my soul. But I find more often than not, I'm agreeing with the non-Christians. I'm just being honest here, okay? Um, and, and I find myself agreeing with, with the non-Christian. It, it's just... The, the, the purpose for which God created the world, the church, the purpose for which God created the world, the center of God's creation, what's it doing in this hymn? It just doesn't seem to fit. It's never been a fan of this church at large. You, you, you go back a little ways and, and look at history, and, and it's, it's, it's even worse, honestly, just being real here. Um, if you look at history, now, you don't read the whitewashed histories that, that, that sugarcoat everything in the past that you get in some of our high school history textbooks or that come out of Christian publishing houses. Look at real history, some, some academic histories, and you'll find that throughout history, the church has done some nasty stuff. It's done a lot of good stuff. I don't want to minimize that. It's done a lot of good stuff, yay, but there's been a lot of nasty stuff. And this is stuff I just have had to struggle with. It's, it's, it's like this is center of God's purpose for creation. It, it, it's... I don't think so. In the, uh, 15th, from the 15th to the 17th century, when the conquistadors came over here in Jesus' name to conquer this land, they brought with them the smallpox. Now, over in Europe, we'd had the smallpox for quite a while, so we had an immunity system uh, against it. It wasn't usually very uh, lethal. But the Native Americans over here, they, didn't ha they had never seen smallpox, so they had no immunity to it. 40% of the people who got smallpox died just from, from contact with us. Now, in the early 17th century, someone uh, uh, developed uh, 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 some inoculation to it, a way of immunizing people from that. But the church leadership said, no, don't administer that to the natives. And they said, well, it's because this is clearly a judgment of God. We don't want to get involved and you know, interfere with God's judgment. Besides, some said, this is proof that it's manifest destiny that God wants us to take over this land. Look, at he's slaughtering them all. Forget the fact that we're the ones doing it because we won't give them the immunization shot. But see, you see stuff like that, and you're wondering, the church, the central purpose for God's creating the world, not so much. In the, in the 15th and 16th century, they began to develop some uh, pain-relieving medicine that they would give to women during child labor. And a lot of church leaders says, no, don't, give the, don't, don't relieve their pain, because that's God's judgment on them. They were the ones who seduced Adam, right? And, and, and so they're, they're supposed to experience pain during childbirth. Don't relieve that pain. King James, the fourth, the one who the King James Bible is named after, um, he, because uh, he authorized it, the King James Bible. This guy found out about a lady who had taken some of that pain medication during childbirth, and he had her burned alive at the stake. Hallelujah. <laughs> Church, the bride of Christ, the center of God's creation, when anesthesia was first developed in the 19th century. That wonderful medicine that allows you to go under and, and when you're getting your leg cut off, so you don't have to experience it all and, and that we so appreciate when we go in for our root canals. Uh, the Christians said, no, don't, don't push, push the, administra the, the administering of that back a long while because they said we're supposed to experience pain. This is God's judgment for sin. The church has often found its side on the wrong, si on the wrong side of things throughout history. And you think this is 
what is that church doing in the middle of this beautiful, beautiful hen? It's a stain. It doesn't belong there. And you go back earlier, it's even worse. I'm almost done. Just bear with me here. But we got to be real about this. The church of the first four centuries was pretty good, not perfect, but it looked like Jesus to a large degree. They were out there rescuing kids that were abandoned by fathers, unwanted kids, and they were out there helping the poor and, and serving the sick when plagues would come in. Uh, they'd stick around and, and often give their life ministering to the folks who had gotten the plague. They, they just were a God-glorifying group of people. When they were being put to death, fed the lions, burned alive, they would often bless the crowds as, as they were being slaughtered. In fact, it was largely the, the, the beauty of the way that they died that spread the gospel. People would see that, and then they joined the tribe, the tribe of these wonderful Christians. And that, that's when the word martyr became synonymous with, 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 with dying uh, for a cause. It literally means to witness, and that's how they witnessed. And so the church grew. The more you tried to oppress it, the more it grew. It was beautiful. Then around the 5th century, Satan uh, came up with a better idea. Since uh, you can't eradicate this thing by trying to squish it, well, let's give it power. And he did. And it worked like a charm. On the 5th century, uh, the church acquires all this political power. And now the mindset completely changes. Instead of serving the word humbly and, and doing what, what Jesus did, now we're going to conquer the world. We've got the power of the sword. And so now we have the birth of the church, militant and triumphant. And now in Jesus' name, we're going to conquer the world. And, and anyone who gets in our way, well, we'll just slaughter them because God's given us the power of the sword. And so... After the 5th century, we see a, a, a history here that is just tragic, full of blood and demonic. As the church in Jesus' name begins to uh, execute heretics and witches and then Jews and then through the crusades coming against the Muslims. And then when, when that fun dried up, we start turning on one another. So you've got centuries of Christian on Christian violence uh, all throughout Europe. The Hundred Years' War and the Thirty Years' War and on and on and on. Christians fighting Christians. And all doing it in the name of God and country, in the name of the, 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 the cross that's going to conquer the world. It was with that mindset that the conquistadors came over here to conquer this land in Jesus' name and slaughtered millions of natives in the process. That same mindset was involved in the American Revolution as we have thousands and thousands of Christians killing one another over who's going to rule this country, the holiday that we celebrate every 4th of July. It was that same mindset that led 700,000 Christians to slaughter one another during this civil war, and it goes on and on and on and on. Center of God's purpose for creation, the bride of Christ, the magnificent bride of Christ. Ah. If you get real about the history here, and a lot of what still goes on today, well, putting that in the middle of this glorious hymn just doesn't fit. It's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's full of discord. I mean, Christ, the image of God, the firstborn of all creation, before all things, created all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rules, and authorities. All things are created by Christ. All things are created for Christ. All things are created through Christ. Christ holds all things together, and he's the firstborn from among the dead, that he can have supremacy in all things, and the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him, and by him all things are being reconciled, and he's bringing peace to all things, so glorious and wonderful, magnificent. And he's the head of the church. Are you proud of that? <laughs> It, 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 it's, it's like an ink stain, big black ink stain on an all-white, beautiful wedding gown. It's like, it's like putting, blowing a foghorn in the middle of a wonderful orchestral piece like Handel's Messiah. It's like, it's like burping or having some other intestinal explosion in the middle of a beautiful, quiet piece like Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune. It's like, it's like having a, putting a piece of horse manure in the middle of a beautiful painting like Vincent van Gogh's Starry, Starry Night. It just doesn't fit. You're ruining it. It's like, it's like putting an obscenity in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't belong there. You're ruining it. The church in the middle of this beautiful hymn, it just doesn't fit. It's incongruous. What is it doing there? Now, maybe you'd say, well, Greg, the, the church that did those things was not the true church. And I would totally agree with you. I would totally agree with you. And the church that killed people, slaughtered people, tried to rule the world, still trying to rule the world, that, that, that's not what Jesus did. That's not the body of Christ. We're, we're, we're the body of Christ. We're supposed to be exactly what Jesus was, loving like Jesus, serving like Jesus, being humble like Jesus, blessing our enemies, not calling on legions of angels uh, to squish them, but rather blessing them. That's what Jesus did as an example for us. That's the body of Christ. That's the true church. And any church that doesn't look like that is simply another religion. Similarly, another religion. I, I, I totally agree with that. 
But then ask yourself the question, where is the true church? Now, you can find throughout history a, a, a thin strand of folks almost unbroken throughout history. While the church was doing a militant and triumphant, we're going to conquer the world, slaughter whoever gets in our way, there's always been a strand of people who did look like Jesus and love like Jesus. Um, and now, usually they were slaughtered by the institutional church, but you do find a small strand. The best example of it is, I think, the Anabaptists in the 15th and 16th century. These are the, the forefathers of the Mennonites. Um, and, and, and these folks got it. They, they got it. That, that, that the Christianity is not just about what you believe. It's about living a certain way that looks like Jesus. And, and so for that reason, that these folks were, were, were persecuted by the church triumphant. Uh, the Catholics and the Anglicans and the Calvinists and the Lutherans, they all slaughtered the Anabaptists, but the Anabaptists refused to return the favor because they were living like Jesus, and they almost were all exterminated. But see, that's the part, that's the one church tradition that has no blood on its hands, and that's why that's the church tradition I align most, most with. I think in my heart of hearts, I'm a Mennonite, because uh, I love that. But see, that strand, this true church, is small. It's rare. You've got to look for it. And so even that doesn't quite fit the majesty, the magnificence, and the grandeur of this, this hymn. But even more importantly, we've got to ask this question. Where's the true church today? Let's, let's, let's get really raw. Are we the true church? Am I part of the true church? Do I look like Jesus? Am I living like Jesus? Are we living like Jesus, loving like Jesus? And here's the thing. I, I, by the grace of God and the power of God, I think we're moving in the right direction. I think I'm moving in the right direction, slowly but surely. Sometimes two steps forward, three steps backwards, but, but there's movement. And, and uh, I, I thank God for that. I, I, I think, you know, when we pool our resources like we did recently uh, and sacrifice to, to, to making space to, to, to serve the poor and turn this place into a homeless shelter, I think that is exactly what the body of Christ should do. And I love it when I hear about the coin dropping in people's uh, slots where they, they get it and they start changing their lives and they're moving in a different direction, going counterculture. We got a bunch of people around here who are sacrificing one of their kidneys, you know, because there's people who don't have any kidneys. I got two. Well, then I, I, I'll, I'll share one, even if they're a total stranger. That's the kind of thing the body of Christ does. And I thank God for that. But if we're real, we'd have to also confess that we're not there yet. I'm not there yet. I fall short. I sin. I can sometimes be very petty. We've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go. And so at best, we might say, well, it's a little bit smaller ink stain. The foghorn isn't quite as loud. It's a little bit, it's less offensive of an of a intestinal explosion in the middle of, of uh, Claire de Lune. It's, it's, it's a little smaller piece of horse manure and maybe a little less offensive obscenity. But it still doesn't fit the hymn. still doesn't fit the hymn. Okay. So what is that doing there? Now, I want to take a totally different approach here. Maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe we're thinking along the wrong path. Ah. Uh, Let's go back to that ink stain in the middle of this magnificent uh, gown, white gown, and read it. Paul says this, And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Okay, notice this. Christ has supremacy in all things. Not the church. The church has supremacy in nothing. Christ has supremacy in all things. In fact, the passage says that Christ is the head of the church so that in all things he would have supremacy, not the church. Now follow this here. It's, it's very important. C.S. Lewis said, I think it was in his book on miracles, he said, a mark of greatness is that you have the capacity and the willingness to enter into the small. He used the example of, of a human playing with a kitten. A human being can, can stoop and enter into the world of a kitten and play the kitten's game, but the kitten can't return the favor. It's a mark of greatness. It's a mark of superior maturity, an adult. that The adult can enter into the world of the child, but the child can't enter into the world of the, the adult. And C.S. Lewis saw this everywhere. Mark of greatness is that you can take something insignificant and do something very significant with it. You can take something that's totally worthless and do something worthwhile with it. You can make yourself small. It's a sign of greatness. And see, I think he was nailing it on the head because this is what we see God doing throughout the Bible. Throughout the Bible. He's a God who shows his greatness by becoming small. small. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. He says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not, the things that don't even exist, to nullify the things that are. Why? So that 
no one may boast before him. God is a God who shows his greatness by becoming small. He shows his wisdom by using foolishness. He shows his strength by, by, by working through weakness. You see this throughout the Bible. So, for example, he chooses Abraham. He works for Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. We go yay when we hear Abraham, the father of all who believe. He's a great guy. But let's not forget that this guy pawned his wife off two times and had other guys sleep with her, saying that she was his sister to save his own skin. Not exactly heroic, godly behavior. And then there's David, wonderful David, King David, man after God's own heart. Hallelujah. But let's not forget that David got a guy's wife pregnant and then had the guy killed to cover up for it. Not exactly courageous, godly behavior. See, God works through Abraham and God works through David. At one point in the biblical narrative, we read about how God used a mule, a donkey. He spoke through a donkey and he was speaking to this pagan sorcerer. And then God used the pagan sorcerer, the message that he gave to the pagan sorcerer through the donkey, to further his purposes with Israel. This is a God who shows how great he is by stooping to the level of a donkey and a pagan sorcerer. See, God shows his greatness by becoming small uh, and, and, and using the weak and the, and the despised things, even things that don't exist, to bring about his purposes in this world. We see this most clearly in Jesus Christ because Jesus is the definitive revelation of God. He's the image of the invisible God. You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. And, and the reason is because in Jesus we see the supreme quintessential example of God showing his greatness by becoming small. God shows his bigness, the character of his bigness, by becoming a human being. God, the God who fills the expanse of space and an infinity beyond that, who holds all the cosmos together, all the galaxies and every molecule and every planet together, this God's grand God transformed himself into a microscopic zygote. It was implanted on the womb of an unwed Jewish peasant girl in the first century. And that shows the kind of greatness he has. This is a God who shows his beauty, his magnificent, unfathomable beauty, by letting himself get beat to a pulp beyond recognition as Jesus was being crucified. This is a God who shows his omnipotent strength by letting himself get crucified out of love for his enemies. This is a God who shows his exaltation by becoming despised. He shows his incredible glory by taking on our shame. He shows his incredible wisdom by looking like a total fool. He shows his power by becoming weak. He shows his, that he's the king of kings and the lord of lords by becoming a humble servant. This is a God who shows his unsurpassable holiness by becoming our sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is wild. This is a God who shows how great he is by doing the opposite. He becomes the opposite of himself. He shows his holiness by becoming our sin. This is a God, a great God, an incredible God, a mind-blowing God who everything is upside down. His ways are not our ways. It just blows your brain when you think about it. A God who, who achieves his purposes by every means other than what you'd expect him to do. Blows your mind. That's why my hair is so crazy. It's been blowing my mind. It's nuts. You see, he, he works through the weak and the despised and the lowly. And now, 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 now we can begin to see maybe why that church is in the middle of this mag magnificent hymn. Because if God can achieve his cosmic purposes through the church, then you know God is great. <laughs> and you know God is God. You know Christ is supreme. You know no one's got any reason to boast, no cause to boast. God can use any means possible. He uses the church. He uses the church to achieve his will. Now we can begin to understand why there is this ink stain in the middle of this beautiful white dress and this foghorn and Handel's Messiah and this intestinal explosion and Claude W.C.'s Claire de Lune and this horse manure and Van Gogh's Starry Starry Night and this obscenity in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It's because God is showing that, that he can take, a, he can create a beautiful white gown out of an a ink blot. He's showing he can create a Handel's Messiah out of a foghorn. He's showing he can create a beautiful sun and a, a clear day loon out of an intestinal explosion. He's showing he can create a Vincent van Gogh magnificent portrait of the whole cosmos using a piece of horse crap. He's showing he can create a Sermon on the Mount out of, out of an obscenity. And folks, guess what? We're the ink stain. We're, we're the obscenity. We're the intestinal explosion. And God's choosing to use this foolish, stupid, dumb, crazy stuff to achieve great stuff, and that shows his greatness. It shows his magnificence. It shows that he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. It shows that all, of, all glory goes to him. He reigns supreme in all things, and no one, no one, not one, has any ground to boast. Praise God. What a God. What, what a creator. What a savior. Ah. 
All right, all right, all right. I, uh, tell the children's church we're going to go over three minutes. Uh, three minutes. Um, okay, uh, how does this apply to us? Really quickly here, real briefly. Three things. Make it practical here. How does it apply to us? Number one, it means we can have hope. Oh, yes, we can have hope. Um, we are called to strive with all of our might by the grace of God and the power of God to strive to be that true church, to strive to be that tribe, that, 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 that thin line uh, of tradition that you see running throughout church history that looks like Jesus and loves like Jesus and serves like Jesus. We're called to seek first the kingdom of God and passionately put out of our lives everything that's inconsistent with the character of God and to be the first fruits. We're called to do that. But we're not called to put our hope in how good we do that. Don't put your hope on how you're doing. Our hope is to be rooted in Jesus Christ. So Paul said this. We read this earlier. Paul said that uh, we're to continue in your faith, established and firm, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Where's the hope? It's in the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has supremacy in all things. Put your hope in that. Put your hope in that. Don't move one inch, Paul is saying. Not one inch from having that hope. Put all your eggs in that basket. All your hope in that basket. Don't let yourself be seduced into putting hope in anything else. Don't put your hope in how you're doing. Strive to do your best, but don't put your hope in how you're doing. Don't put your hope on how the church is doing. Don't put your hope on how, how for good, goodness sake, don't put your hope on how some candidate's doing, please. Don't put your hope on how uh, America's doing. Don't put your hope on how the economy's doing. Don't put your hope on how the world's doing. Don't put your hope on what Iran's doing. Don't put your hope on, on, on anything other than Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Rock of ages, the one who never changes, the one who's the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. You put your hope on anything else, and it's going to go up, and it's going to go down. If I take my eyes off of Jesus Christ for a nanosecond, I, 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 I get cynical. I just get cynical. Uh, you, you know, look at this world. You just, someone said, uh, how, how does it go? Uh, he said that life is, uh, life is a uh, tragedy to those who feel and a comedy to those who think. And so if you're a thinking, feeling person, that means life is a tragic comedy. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> It is, it is. You look around and it's like hopeless. But you know what? That's fine because as a matter of fact, it is hopeless outside of Jesus Christ. That's a very appropriate thing to feel, which is just one more reason to, to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. All your hope on Jesus Christ. I, I look around the world, I can get very cynical, but you know what? I'm a very optimistic person. I, t the future looks very, very bright. Thank you. Because Christ reigns supreme. And I don't know what's going to go on with Iran, and I don't know what's going on in Palestine. I don't know about all that. And I care about that stuff. We're going to be peacemakers, but I'm not going to lose sleep over anything because Jesus Christ reigns supreme always, forever, and ever, and ever. Amen. Put all your hope in Jesus Christ. Secondly, secondly, opting out is not an option. Listen up. Uh, opting out is not an option. Um, I, I hear this all the time, you probably do too, where people say, you know what, I quit. I'm not going to go to church. I still believe in Jesus, of course. Uh, I still believe in God. But the church is foolish. The church is shallow. The church is full of hypocrites. The church is dumb. The church is, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Got that. I'm not going to fight you on that. Been there, done that. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. People even feel, and I get this, they feel superior because they don't go to church. Like, my God's too, too big to have anything to do with that. And so you feel like you're shallow just by participating in it. And I, I really understand that. But if you are a Jesus follower, you submit to Jesus, and Jesus is the one who died for this bozo thing called the church. Jesus is the one who gave his life for this silly, foolish, foolish stupid thing full of hypocrites. Yeah, you know, and, and, and therefore, opting out is not an option. I'm sorry. I, it's... Now, we're all called to be part of the church, the body of Christ. That doesn't mean that you've got to come to a weekend service and listen to a sermon and, and, and worship with a bunch of other people in a large auditorium. But it does mean that everyone who follows Christ is called to be in community with others where you serve together and, 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 and love one another and grow together and study together and spread the gospel together and, 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 and minister together. We're all called to do that. In some capacity, however it looks, everybody, everybody, everybody is called to be a part of that. Opting out simply isn't an option. There's no concept of a solo Christian in the New Testament. Uh, yeah, you know, it is foolish. It's foolish. It's, it, it's, uh, but but uh, God uses that. God uses things like this so that he'll have su supremacy in all things. It's not about the church. It's about Christ. 
And uh, so for Christ's sake, for Christ's sake, get yourself into church. <laughs> Podrusioners, for Christ's sake, listen to me there. Uh, you know, if you're in an area where you don't have a church, talking to our wonderful Podrusioners, we've got thousands of them out there. Uh, Woodland Hills Extension, I love you guys out there. Get great testimonies out there. But Podrusioners, if you're in a locale where you can't, there's no church around you, or maybe there is a church, but it's not one that will feed your soul or maybe it will damage your soul. I get this a lot where they you go to church and it makes you want to become a Buddhist every Sunday. Uh, yeah, I got that. But you know what? Start one. Start. Be the church. Uh, you're, you're, just invite a person over and, 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 and share the gospel with them. And when they get converted, you worship together and study together. And, and then you, you spread the word more. That's church. That's church right there. Uh, where two or three are gathered together, Jesus is in the midst of them. You got yourself church right there. And so I encourage you, proud listeners, to start, be a church planner. We at Woodland Hills Church right now, all together, we commission you to be our church planners. Hallelujah. You are our church planners. Let it begin. All right. And you don't have to go to seminary to do it either. Just start. Finally, the final word is this. Uh, it means that God can use you. If you got this message, it means God can use you. No ifs, ands, or buts. If God can use an Abraham and God can use a David, God can use a mule and God can use this pagan sorcerer, God can use you. If God can use a Greg Boyd or a Carl or a Jim or a Betty or any other person up here, then God can use you. And there's not much difference between the Greg Boyd and the mule. God is stooping about equally as much in, in both cases. <laughs> See, it doesn't matter what you've done, what you've been, what crimes you've committed, what struggles you've been through, all the heinous things you've done. Don't let the devil take you out of the game for those stupid, silly reasons. As though your sin can compete with Jesus in terms of his forgiveness and righteousness, it doesn't stand a chance. No, don't, don't, don't let that take you out of the game. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what, what, what your present struggles are. You can be an ink stain on an all-white dress. You can be a foghorn in the middle of Handel's Messiah. You can be the, the intestinal explosion in the middle of Clarity of Lune. Maybe your life is nothing but one big horse pile in the middle of Van Gogh's beautiful painting. Maybe you are in obscenity in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, welcome to the club. This is, what it, this is where we are. You belong here. Amen. And, and God can use you. God can use you. Now, strive to be all you can be in growing in Christ, but, 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 but also know that God uses you as you are, right here and right now. Right here and right now. Um, we are the bride of Christ. And let's be honest, Sometimes we look like the bridezilla of Christ. Uh, but when we surrender everything we have, including the ink stain and the foghorn and the crab and the burp and the obscenity, when we surrender to him, he can make something beautiful out of it. He makes something beautiful in it. He starts to do something beautiful through you. And even using all your stuff to do it, and he starts to do something beautiful through you. And why? That's because you can't boast because he has supremacy in all things. He has supremacy in all things. Surrender your life to him. He reigns supreme. Hallelujah. What a God. What a God. I, I just, I, I, I'm just blown away. I, I, he, he's just beautiful. He's just beautiful. A mind-blowing, beautiful, unexpected, crazy, odd God. But thank God for that. Because that's why we fit. I'm going to uh, close in a little prayer. And as I do, I want to ask the prayer teams to come forward. And if you're here this morning and have anything on your heart, any burden that you're carrying, whatever it may be about, come forward and receive prayer from these folks. Uh, and everything you share will be held in confidence. Uh, so don't worry about that. But I encourage you not to take that care out with you. Father, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, you are beautiful uh, beyond description. Uh, and you, you just blow us away. Thank you, God, for being a God who stoops to magnificent depths uh, to show forth your greatness. As we leave this place, I pray, Lord God, that your spirit would be motivating us and moving us and encouraging us to, to belong to that tribe of the true church that puts on display the beauty of Christ, but also a, a people, Lord God, who surrender our yucky stuff over to you, knowing that you're so wise, so, so supreme, that you can use that as well to further your purposes in this world. We live to glorify you, to, bring, to show forth your supremacy in how we love ourselves, how we love others, how we treat our neighbors. Holy Spirit, be honest, work through us as we leave this place to further your kingdom in Jesus' name. And the bridezilla of Christ said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Go out and spread the good word.